our next presenter will be Megan Ryan. We'll have her share her screen. Um, her title is Post-Surgical Complications in Patients Undergoing Baclofen Pump Implantation. And again, anyone coming in, if you could just turn off um, your video and mute your sound for our best video quality. Thank you. All right, Meg, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, so as she mentioned, my name is Meg. If you'd like to reach out to me or connect with me after the presentation, my email is at the top of the slide as well as my Twitter handle. All right. So baclofen is a drug that acts as an agonist of GABA-B receptors within the central nervous system. This essentially means that baclofen is a muscle inhibitor, which makes it a great treatment for muscle spasticity associated conditions such as cerebral palsy. Muscle spasticity refers to uh, when a muscle cannot relax, it is in a constant state of contraction, so it can be very debilitating for the patients. Intrathecal baclofen therapy is a type of therapy that's becoming more and more common in treating spasticity. This is essentially when uh, baclofen is delivered at a constant rate to the intrathecal or subarachnoid space, as we know it, of the spinal cord. And this has been shown to be more effective than oral baclofen in treating spasticity because you are getting higher concentrations of that drug within the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So in the top right corner, you see a baclofen pump system that's involved in this therapy. There is a baclofen pump reservoir that is placed in the abdomen, usually subfascially. And then you can see the catheter that is going back towards the subarachnoid space. Again, in a patient x-ray, you have the baclofen pump reservoir, you have the catheter, and then very faintly, we can see the catheter going up through that space. However, intrathecal baclofen therapy has many potential complications. Patients can have CSF leaks, they can have catheter complications, infections from uh, the related surgeries, drug withdrawals, overdoses, and other complications as well. So we wanted to review the outcomes and complications from intrathecal baclofen therapy in a large case series in order to improve the knowledge base for neurosurgeons performing baclofen pump implantation surgeries. And for the purposes of this presentation, I will be focusing on catheter complications. Um, we did observe many different complications, uh, but we thought that comp catheter complications would be among the most frequent and that fewer complications would be associated with a newer model of catheter called the Ascenda versus older model catheters. We had 142 patients included in our retrospective chart review at Children's Hospital Colorado. We compiled all of their data into a REDCap database. And then we did reviews of a test known as a CT dye study. And this is a test that's commonly ordered when a catheter complication is suspected. So um, characterizing patent catheters through this way were, was really helpful for compiling our database. And then we performed statistics. Overall, cerebral palsy was the most common uh, diagnosis in our patient population. And this is a very common muscle spasticity associated condition. The most frequent tone abnormality that we observed was spastic quadriparesis. And that means that the patient had muscle spasticity in all four limbs. 111 patients in our patient population had a complication. So this is a high number, but I wanted to note that complications can be very mild and then they can range to more severe and requiring surgical intervention. So of the 111 patients that had a complication, 57% had a revision to correct the complication, 13% had a surgery to correct an infection, 8% had a procedure known as a blood patch, and this is a procedure used to treat a CSF leak that's not going away on its own. 20% had their pumps permanently removed for varying reasons, and 2% required no further intervention. Subcutaneous CSF leaks were the most common uh, complication, and that was followed closely by catheter complications with 63 patients experiencing a catheter issue. So that's kind of what we were expecting. And I just wanted to note that subcutaneous CSF leaks are not usually concerning because they uh, resolve over time on their own, so often don't need any further intervention. And then, as I mentioned, there were many other complications that we observed, some being very mild, such as vomiting after surgery, that's very common, and some being more severe, such as baclofen withdrawals or overdoses. We then compared the different model types of catheter. Uh, so we have the Ascenda catheter here in blue, that's the newer model. 
and all older models were represented by orange. So what we found was that patients who had an Ascenda catheter had significantly fewer complications than older model uh, patients. And then uh, for catheter-related malfunctions or infections, we found that patients who had an Ascenda catheter had 21.9% um, of them had a catheter issue, and that was significantly higher for older models. Um, so this is what we were expecting and kind of hoping to see with the, with the newer models. And then as I mentioned, there were also CT dye studies included in our database. This is a test that's ordered when a catheter complication is suspected. So here we have a group of CTs from a patient who had a patent catheter, and I'll just show you kind of how this is characterized. So in this transverse CT on the left here, you see this hyperdense semilunar shape. And that shows that the dye is filling the subarachnoid space. So this is what you would want to see in a working catheter. Again, in the sagittal section, you see that um, hyperdense area is right where it needs to be. And then in the transverse CT at the level of the baclofen pump, you see this little white spot here. And that shows the catheter just beginning to enter the subarachnoid space. And then I wanted to point out that you can see the catheter in two other locations here. So um, according to the CT, the catheter appears where it needs to be. Um, it doesn't appear to have any sort of leaks or any issues. This, however, would be an example of a patient who had a pseudomeningocele or a CSF leak. So here you can see there's no hyperdense semilunar shape. Instead, the dye is escaping into the posterior back tissues. Again, in the sagittal CT, so this is a very um, obvious CS CSF leak. They're not usually this obvious, um, but in this case, the, pa the patient would have required a catheter revision. So in conclusion, subcutaneous CSF leaks and catheter complications were the most frequent complication type. As I mentioned, subcutaneous CSF leaks are not usually very concerning because they can resolve over time, and neurosurgeons can strive to prevent them. They can ensure good CSF flow after catheter placement, and they can also keep patients flat for several days post-implantation. And if a CSF leak does develop, they can use um, what's known as an abdominal binder to help it resolve on its own without surgical intervention. And then when comparing the catheter types, we found the newer Ascenda catheter model revealed fewer catheter complications than older models. And this is kind of what we were hoping to see because Medtronic developed this catheter type with a unique four-layer design to kind of prevent uh, tears, migrations, other complications as well. So we would just hope that in the future, as neurosurgeons become better and better at implanting uh, baclofen pumps, that newer models of catheter would be developed. I'd just like to give a huge thanks to everyone on this slide for giving me this opportunity and helping me with this project. Are there any questions? Thank you, Meg. Um, so uh, there's a, there is one question about, um, was there any conflict of interest statements? Um, there were no conflict of interest statements. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and how does the four layers of the catheter work? So the four layers of catheter, um, it's very complicated and I don't understand every single layer, um, but there are layers um, that are made of different, they're made, made of different materials. And um, from my understanding, there's one layer that's particularly stronger than the others that is kind of made to prevent tears. And then um, the other layers as well kind of help prevent against migration. Um, there's a layer that helps re prevent against disconnection with the, uh, the bracket that attaches to the pump itself. Okay. All right, are there any other questions? All right, if not, thank you, Meg. And our next speaker is Una Park. And the title of her talk is, My Vagina Did What? Evaluating a mobile app of 3D enteroceal uh, anatomy in post-hysterectomy women. Sorry, John, sorry to jump in, but um, I, I wanted to make sure that there was or was not any conflict of interest in Meg's study. And if so, that should be stated. 
Uh, okay. Um, because it's a clinical study, I think it's important to make a note of that. Yeah, so we, um, we don't have conflict of interest uh, statements um, from any of our authors. Um, so, yeah. I know it's a, it's a statement versus whether or not there was conflict of interest. Like, for example, any of your clinical um, mentors, you know, have any financial interest in this new Ascenda product? That's right. Yes. Yep. They they do not. Um, none of them. Uh, none of them receive any funding from Medtronic uh, to use the Ascenda catheters. Um, from my understanding, they simply go, get, go upstairs hospital, and get daddy and have him help you. The, the, they use the Ascenda catheter um, because it is, has been shown to be the best model out there and it is a hospital wide use. So thank, thank you for clarifying your question. Yep. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Meg.